online event itself will now consist of a short presentation of the key findings um, of the IEP policy paper that I talked about and a subsequent panel with stakeholders and experts focusing on trade related issues. Um, and the objective of uh, this exercise is to elaborate on ways forward in light of the COVID-19 pandemic. And without further ado, I will now give the floor to Marianne Ketunen from the IEP, who was the lead author of that study, um, who will present it and also moderate the panel. She is the principal policy analyst and head of program for global challenges and SDGs at IEP and has um, over 10 years of experience in issues related to the EU and international biodiversity policy. Um, and I'm very much looking forward to having a conversation with all of you. So Marianne, the floor is yours. Great. Uh, <clears throat> thanks, Lisa. And good morning to everybody from my side as well. So I'll be your co-pilot for this morning together with Lisa um, to talk about um, EU policy, trade policy and, um, and uh, where it should be going in the future um, to support sustainability. So as Lisa said, um, I'll say a few words about the study to give kind of food for thought for the panel, and then we will start the discussion. First with our panel members that you've seen, um, seen and I will be introducing, <clears throat> introducing later, and then also you know, basically opening the floor to questions from the audience, um, some reflections we have already lined up um, uh, in advance to kind of have start the discussion going and then also welcoming everybody who's on the call to to shoot some questions to us to the panelists uh, as well so please you know while you listen in use the slider function or use a chat to uh, to have some questions we will be picking up them intermittently as well the, the aim is to um, have enough space to have discussion so we have a couple of hours to to um, to have an exchange views online on this but first indeed as lisa said let's take a look at some food for thought from our study and also what is going on since the study uh, for, this, um, for this event. Great, I'm hoping you are seeing my screen now. Um, so basically, as Lisa said, we are looking at um, the EU Green Deal what it promises for EU trade policy and what it promises particularly for the environment in this context. And let me see, can you see my screen actually moving to another slide? Uh, I, not yet. Yes, now you can, right? I'm hoping you're seeing a slide which is basically yes. called starting point for discussion. Thank you. Yeah, it seems to be a bit slow for some reason. But so the starting point for discussion for today um, is as follows. So um, when we looked at the uh, EU trade policy and how it's performing, um, basically on paper, EU trade policy puts a great emphasis on the trade being a vehicle for sustainable development. That's you know been already before the Green Deal, uh, the situation. That's on paper. But in practice, um, it really seems that the net positive contribution of EU's trade to sustainable development has yet been achieved. So there is still certainly potential there to to do better. And I think basically then what we have now towards the future in our hands is the Green Deal that gives us a new boost for the trade and environmental agenda to be combined better for sustainability. But obviously since the Green Deal, we also have, our, have at our hands um, the pandemic crisis, which really throws a real kind of a curveball into the mix in terms of how trade will happen, what will happen to trade in the future, and then obviously, of course, that will interact with what we can do with trade and how we can better integrate environment into the trade in the future. And that's kind of what we will be trying to discuss today here. And our paper, which was, you know, pre-COVID era, obviously looks at this in the context of the Green Deal as things were foreseen to go before the pandemic hit us. But now we are also trying to reflect during this call today and this event today, what might be the new future, the new normal when we move, move forward. And that's why I've also asked the panelists particularly to perhaps, you know, to help us to reflect from this perspective, because you know, the answers aren't evident. You know, there is a, there is a crystal ball which we can try to look into, but um, you know, whether it tells us all the answers, uh, it might, um, that might be a big question. But let's remind ourselves, you know, what the EU Green Deal exactly says for, for and promises for environmental integration and sustainability in trade. So it has something for the EU's 
own transition, more ecological transition, it basically says that trade policy can support EU's ecological transition, so EU itself, but it also then looks at EU in a global context and says that EU can, should use its expertise in setting green regulations to encourage uh, partner countries to design similar rules. So it has both the element of you know, trade helping EU to transition to sustainability, but also EU as an active player globally to help transition to sustainability. More specifically, the Green Deal um, has a promise to step up the efforts to implement the trade and sustainability provisions um, within the trade deals, existing trade deals. Uh, it, for example, talks about the chief trade enforcement officer to be put in place to help this. Um, and I both, you know, I'm also certainly curious to, um, to, uh, to know, you know, what perhaps this particular trade uh, enforcement officer might be doing to, to help this. And maybe we'll get some answers from that from, uh, from, uh, from our colleagues from DT Trade today. Um, the Green Deal also puts the Paris Agreement uh, into the spotlight, so it says that it should be an essential element towards the future uh, trade agreements particularly. Um, the uh, Green Deal also identifies that EU should be a driving uh, force or could be a driving force for climate environmental standards globally, as said earlier, and particularly perhaps in a context of two, two sets of standards. One set of standards is about circularity, so EU circular economy package, what that will bring to the EU, elevating EU circularity standards for products, and how will that then affect the world through trade? So the, basically the goods that will be imported to EU. But in addition to that circularity, there's also the promise of deforestation and forest degradation free products and value chains. So basically EU saying that um, we should be trying not to import products which cause deforestation or forest degradation elsewhere. So two different sets of standards, specifically a focus here, certainly. Um, and then obviously there is also the much talked about carbon border adjustment mechanism um, and how that might be then obviously um, influencing the trade in the future uh, that EU is looking into as a last resort, you know, to prevent carbon leakage and prevent high carbon content um, products entering the market as well. So that's what the Green Deal says and promises to us. So there's quite a lot of you know, concrete elements in the Green Deal that will hopefully help to green the trade and make it more sustainable. But then just to then to remind us all, you know, so what is our policy toolbox? So what does EU have in the context of this trade uh, policy as concrete tools to make this all happen? Um, and the toolbox is as follows. So we obviously have the EU's trade agreements and within those trade agreements, we have those specific trade and sustainable development provisions that are there to create the bottom line uh, for environmental, um, um, environmental safety, basically, um, that trade should safeguard. And then to support the um, trade agreements um, with, that are taking place, we also have sustainability impact assessments, which are the tools that look at the impacts of trade liberalization before, during the trade agreement and negotiations are taking place. So basically the evidence base underpinning the trade agreements. So those are the trade tools, as I would call them, uh, in a trade toolbox. But in addition to that, we actually do also have what I call the non-trade tools. So tools which are not specifically trade policy, uh, but they actually do impact trade and trade policy and are part of also the trade agreements are referred to as well in the trade agreements. And what I mean by that is, is the types of regulations the EU has, like EU timber regulation or EU wildlife trade regulation or the upcoming EU conflict mineral regulation. So basically different specific sector specific regulations that um, regulate what type of products EU is allowing to its market. So for example, in the context of timber regulation, EU should not be allowing to its market um, any timber that is illegally, um, illegally logged. So that's kind of very specific sector related regulation we also have in place that can support greening of trade and be linked to and is part of the broader, broader trade, trade tools. So that's our toolbox at the moment. And then, of course, the question is referring to what I said earlier, that, you know, we could do better based on the evidence. Why is the toolbox not really working as well as it could or should? Um, and looking into the literature and looking into the evidence, uh, three things come, come forward. So when it comes to the sustainability provisions of the three uh, trade agreements, it seems that bases are not implemented effectively enough at, as, as of yet. 
So people highlight that there is no proper monitoring process for those provisions. Um, there is a lack of clear goals that would help to them to be implemented uh, more efficiently. And particularly, there is a lack of effective mechanism to address the non-compliance when it comes, comes, comes to be. So an effective dispute settlement mechanism um, is something that people are saying is, is, is lacking. Um, then when it comes to the underpinning evidence, so the EU sustainability impact assessments, um, when one looks through those assessments, it becomes clear that environment is not treated as comprehensively and as robustly as it could be or should be. This is partly also a technical question because you know, it is quite uh, technically tricky to be able to, you know, to capture or forecast uh, the impacts on biodiversity, for example, or forest degradation um, through trade liberalization. So you know, we can go do better through improving the methods to do so. But regardless, you know, the situation is that you know, um, we can do better in terms of the evidence base on which we build our uh, trade agreements on. And finally, perhaps there is maybe an untapped potential of using those tools outside the trade, props, trade uh, toolbox proper. Um, to support the trade domain, so the likes of timber regulation, wildlife trade regulation, or the conflict mineral regulation. Um, and it will be really interesting to see in the future, for example, how then the EU circular economy package and you know, the types, the kind of you know, standards that it will bring forward will uh, impact on, on, have impact on, on trade as well. So those are some you know, thoughts and, and ideas as to why, you know, what we could do better um, and uh, you know, why Toolbox isn't working uh, from the literature and also from our analysis as well. So then there's some food for thought in terms of the pandemic aftermath. So what we've seen in immediately has, of course, been that there's been disruptions in the global supply chains and global trade because of the pandemic. This is for a number of reasons, you know, not the least because, you know, people can't go to work, you know, they can't be producing things, but also, of course, because certain production lines have been directed elsewhere. But point being, we have very complex global supply chains um, going on at the moment and the um, Trade is a key element in making those supply chains you know, work from the world towards Europe and, and vice versa. And we've seen big in interruptions in, in that supply chain. In the long term, it's been predicted that trade is expected to shrink you know, between 30 to 32% in 2020. So quite a you know, significant uh, decrease in, in trade is, is foreseen due to the economic crisis that, that follows. Um, and it's also been predicted that you know, trade slowdown will hit the export-led countries maybe the most, and especially the primary commodities exporting countries. Uh, and we perhaps are also looking at the global south here as, as well as the hardest hit, hit countries. So then the question is, you know, what will be the response? What's, what's the response vis-a-vis -vis trade um, to all this? Um, people can, you know, are discussing or are suspecting they can be the closing of borders, both for imports or exports. So countries will, for example, see that they will, they, they're worried that they will need certain commodities themselves, so therefore they will close borders for exporting them, or they will, you know, want to be protecting their own industry, so they will close, close borders for, you know, imports to their countries. So both kind of closing borders, you know, can and has happened in the past. Um, there's also foreseen or thought to be perhaps a push towards the deglobalization, as, as they call it, or higher self-sufficiency. So basically, there's a realization that, well, we are really in the mercy of these global supply chains, should be perhaps therefore not to be so, and maybe bring the, shorten the supply chains, bring the trade closer to us, and in a way, in that way, kind of, not close the borders, but basically make, make things closer to home, bring things closer to home which will obviously then uh, prevent opportunities for trade and, you know, for example, you know, global, global trade. So the question then comes, you know, what could be the response that would be something else, uh, particularly in the context of, you know, the role that trade can play in the green recovery more broadly. So we at IP, we've been talking about um, what could trade for green trade for green recovery be and look like um, as, as an ideal. Um, so that's a discussion in the EU, also in Geneva at the moment, and people are kind of trying to find, you know, the ways to position trade to support the recovery in, in a green way and see, you know, how, how that would play out. And hopefully, you know, perhaps we'll be looking forward to hear thoughts on that from the panel members today, but also obviously anybody from the audience as well to share what, what, could, what could the green future look like and the role that trade would play in that, particularly in the COVID recovery. So, um, for Food for Thought, I've highlighted a number of recommendations that you know, come from our paper, but also you know, some of our more, re more recent um, pandemic 
aftermarket related um, thinking. Um, and this is not all our recommendations. It's a long list, you know, kind of a shopping list, pick and choose. But I thought, you know, I pick a few, you know, for you to think about. So some key recommendations for the EU for future. Um, improving the use of sustainability impact assessments for the environment would be the first one. Uh, I strongly feel that our trade agreements can be only as good as, you know, the supporting evidence uh, that underpins them and also supports them, their implementation. So working on that front um, is, is one suggestion that we have. Then people are suggesting a um, more stringent dispute settlement mechanism for the sustainable uh, development provisions of trade. So basically, if people aren't, if we aren't, if our partner countries ourselves, if we're not complying with the sustainability uh, clauses we set for ourselves, you know, we should, we should be able to hold um, ourselves and others responsible uh, and accountable for that. So how to do that better. Um, also, there's a thought to take the um, sustainability provisions out of the box that they are in now. So basically in one chapter, sustainable development chapter in the trade agreements and try to also implement them more holistically throughout the trade agreement. So for example, looking at the different sectors that trade uh, agreement is, is focusing on and already in that particular segment also looking at the bottom line for environmental sustainability. Um, rather than only having everything you know, in one, one only chapter, which kind of you know, boxes them out and not necessarily uh, gives the message of, of proper integration environment in the sector of trade. And that's also something I'd love to hear thoughts you know, from, from the panel, from you, you know, would that be a possible, possible technically to do that and would it actually perhaps make a difference to basically have a more holistic way of looking at these things in the trade agreements. Obviously, then one thought we have is to use the implementation of the EU circular economy package as an elevator of standards, sustainability standards in Europe to also raise standards globally. So linking perhaps that also for more standards with low carbon, um, low carbon uh, for products, content for products. And then finally, in the global, global scale, um, particularly in the COVID aftermath, um, seeing you know, whether EU could champion adopting a twin, uh, in the G20 context, a green trade for green recovery kind of initiative to champion that in a G20 context on a, on a highest of level of international governance. And also perhaps you know, championing uh, creating an independent interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary panel uh, to support the WTO um, negotiations, contributing to SDGs um, and um, the Paris Agreement. So a bit of like a um, you know, in the, in, uh, independent panel uh, of the likes of you know, the climate panel, the biodiversity and ecosystem services in you know, a panel to support trade in a WTO context. So those are a few of our thoughts, um, the ways, ways forward. And I'd love to hear you know, thoughts from, from the panel and audience uh, also uh, linking perhaps to these recommendations as well, whether they're realistic, uh, whether they would be game changers or, or, or not. And also if you had to pick and choose, what do you think would be the most um, important one? But that's some of the food for thought um, from, from my and our side. And then of course, the questions for this morning uh, that I'll be presenting the panel with is really about how do you advance in environmental integration of EU trade, EU trade policy? Um, what will the EU trade look like in the, in the, in the um, pandemic aftermath? What are the challenges? Are there any opportunities? And indeed, you know, how there can we ensure green trade for green recovery in the future? But with that, I think I will stop sharing my screen um, and I will uh, move on to having reflections uh, from our panel. And also, of course, you know, first introducing our, our panel to, um, to everybody on this call today. So um, we have lined up a um, very interesting panel for you to uh, hear some thoughts from and also ask some questions from. Um, so we have three DGs from the European Commission represented. We have DG Trade, we have DG Climate Action, and also DG Environment, all of them, you know, integrally involved um, and uh, part of creating the EU trade, making trade more sustainable in the future. We have um, Anna Cavaccini um, from the European uh, Parliament, and we also have a representative from the uh, European Climate Foundation, um, Emmanuel, as well. But um, moving on, first we have Neil Lalor starting our panel from um, DT Trade. Neil is a policy officer, particularly focusing on environment integration into trade. And I don't, can't really think of anybody better to kick off our panel discussion um, and some further food for thought in terms of what, um, what our path 
into green, green EU trade will be. So, um, Neil, I've asked you the question as to, to reflect, you know, what would be the uh, building on the Green Deal? You know, what are then the key, key issues for DG trade to pick up, take this really more concretely forward in the future? And obviously, of course, as well, you know, uh, what do you see that the um, COVID aftermath uh, will do to trade? You know, what challenges will be there for greening EU trade? And also, are there any opportunities in that context as well? So, uh, Neil, um, over to you first to, to kick us off. Okay, thank you very much, Marianne. Thank you for the invitation to your colleagues. Um, yes, it's the, I, there's three of us here today, so I will primarily focus on trade aspects, but some of the kind of non-trade policies that are strongly related to trade, but then leave a lot of the Green Deal discussion to colleagues from uh, Clima and DG Environment. Um, to basically, in short, there's a lot in the European Green Deal communication from December, and there's even more in the communications that came out in March in Circular Economy and even last week on biodiversity. So this, this, is, this is good timing for an event. Uh, even though you wanted to hold it in March, this is probably <laughs> better timing. Uh, we're, we're kind of at the stage where the detailed design, some, a lot of it kicks off because a lot of, uh, if, you, if you look at the annex to the Green Deal communication from last December, there's a lot of uh, legislative proposals expected between now and the end of 2021. Uh, a lot of it's in sequence and there's even more in the annexes to the, the other communications. So, um, I, as I said, I will focus on the multilateral bilateral aspects. Yeah. Uh, I will try to come back to your questions, um, but in order to say what we're planning to take forward or what concrete, I need to give a little bit of background. Um, so to, to start off, I, I guess that the main focal area of the last 10 years for DG Trade has been, the Commission has been on bilateral trade agreements. And um, since the Korean agreement, we have a large number of uh, agreements with TSD chapters on covering. So that these agreements now cover a lot of our large proportion of our trade. Um, they cover the subjects, labor, climate, environment, these chapters. They uh, include commitments, confirmation of commitments of partners to the international agreements to which they're a party. So that the, the core ILO convention, international labor conventions, trade relevant MEAs, including the Paris Agreement, but, but also beyond the coverage and the conventions partners have agreed a number of provisions on things that are not covered in conventions like illegal forestry, responsible business conduct, and on issues on, you know, important principles for us that are not ingrained in, in international rules like uh, the precautionary principle. So we have uh, a number of negotiations ongoing and we're expanding some of the topics like some circular economy is now in Australia and non-green issues like gender in Chile, uh, which are important to other constituencies. And um, looking forward, as, as we said, as you mentioned as well, we propose to make the respect to the Paris Agreement an essential element of, uh, for future comprehensive trade agreements. Um, beyond the subject, the, the dry subject matter, <laughs> Uh, on a practical level, uh, as we mentioned in the Green Deal communication, that the, the TST chapter also uh, acts as a very important platform to engage with trade partners, not just with the climate environment ministries, but also with the trade industry ministries. They're often the same ministry in other countries, uh, but also very importantly with civil society. So there's, there's a whole infrastructure around feedback and giving, uh, you know, if you look at our website, we have a huge amount of uh, joint statements, operational conclusions on issues and priorities with partners. Um, if you look even, the, I'm, I'm covering Ukraine, and you look at the, the operation conclusions on labor and forestry, they're extremely detailed and extremely concrete. And I can give you many other examples like climate with Canada, labor with Vietnam. With the, so, but you also mentioned one beyond the TSD chapter. Um, in, a, in my previous reincarnation, I was a lead on energy and raw materials. And in there we have uh, on nego ongoing negotiations with Australia, New Zealand, Chile, uh, very important producers of so-called green tech raw materials. And uh, there, there's a number of 
proposed provisions on environmental impact assessment, uh, offshore safety, uh, also on integration of renewable energy into grids. Uh, so these are quite far reaching, quite, quite interesting if you, if you want to further explore this from your side. Um, in the area of circular economy and in a number of our uh, proposals or ongoing negotiations, I can't on the top of my head uh, pick out which, but there's uh, articles on reuse and remanufacturing of goods. So there's obviously kind of food for thought there. And um, we also have, you know, when we, we come to environmental goods, we, we, we do uh, front load liberalization of environmental goods in, in our agreements. So. Uh, we would argue that there's a, yes, of course, there's always, you know, possibility for more action, but there is a, a lot of streamlining across, especially the, the important areas. Um, I don't know if you, you noticed as well, upon a mandate of the, the council last year, we put forward a position on the Energy Charter Treaty the other day. So that has an, an awful lot of position uh, articles on uh, with articles from the typical TSD chapter, but also on environmental impact assessment. So that's, you know, that, that's what we were asked to do by the council. So we've, we've followed through on that and that is uh, another form of uh, streamlining. Um, in terms of assessing the impact of the FDAs, of course, you know, the SIAs are, you know, big, large uh, undertakings, extremely in depth. Um, and you know they they can always there's always with anything there's 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 room for improvement and one of those areas is the in depth treatment of biodiversity and now I'm going to plug your work, where uh, <laughs> you <laughs> the IEED co-host today are undertaking a study for our colleagues in DG Environment on biodiversity and how it can be better incorporated in future FDA. So I understand that's going to be finished by the end of the yeah. year. So uh, you know we're in your good hands, Marianne. <laughs> Um, we, we're doing our best indeed there, but that's also, I said, you know, it's technical, there are technical challenges there, but, you know, I think, you know, at least we, we are, you know, taking some right steps, which is good. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, there, there's the issue of, you know, measuring and monitoring, but I'll come back to that in a minute. Yeah. Uh, there's also the pre-implementation, so things that have been negotiated, but not yet ratified or implemented. So we've done an awful lot of work with Vietnam, especially on the ILO issues, uh, which has been quite successful and, uh, you know, I, I'm not in charge of any of these uh, negotiations, but I, I understand that was an important part of progressing it. Uh, and this, this pre-implementation work will obviously remain important uh, going forward. Um, and, but to come back to your question on like what, what concrete initiatives, especially those mentioned in the Green Deal, and one of those is on you know, enforcement and implementation. So, you know, the, we have been, as we've signed more in agreements and we probably have less on the table, uh, still, negotiations are still important, but, you know, it's, we've obviously more and more negotiated. Uh, the focus has been more and more on enforcement. So we're like furthering our stress on implementation and enforcement. And we mentioned in December that this would be uh, further enhanced with the appointment of a chief trade enforcement officer, which you mentioned. Yep. Now, the ins and outs of what the CTEO is, what we call it shorthand. Yeah. I don't want to keep saying that <laughs> uh, it, it's still being elaborated. Uh, it would be a high level position in DG trade. So it's quite important, but there's some things I can say in terms of scope and role, but limited number of things. So it would cover, would probably cover multilateral, bi plurilateral, bilateral, uh, market access as well as trade and sustainable development, but also anti-dumping, anti-circuit convention safeguard. Um, so, and, and the roles, it would uh, have probably two broad roles to increase the efficiency of our work, so legal breaches enforcement. Uh, this is a lot of kind of internal cuisine in terms of streamlining internal processes and you know, coordination, et cetera, et cetera, and if, uh, consistency and ensuring breaches are followed up. But also the, the, the second role would be that, you know, also a communication role to, to, to tell the outside world what we're doing. Um, and, uh, you know, the kind of public face of, of enforcement uh, with the other institutions and also with stakeholders. Um, in terms of the line between enforcement and implementation, obviously enforcement is a continuity of implementation. 
So uh, you know, the, the CTO would be expected to have a kind of a coordination role on the implementation, um, identifying, prioritizing, um, and you know promoting the agreements and helping businesses to see what they you know what they what they can and cannot do, or the operation the opportunities and. Of course, implementation and enforcement requires monitoring, and this is where I come back to the, you know, information. And um, you know, the, the, does a patchwork, you know, our, our TSD chapters are based on a, a large number of MEAs. I won't talk about the ILO, um, the MEAs, and you, you, you've got the kind of the biological ones like CITES, biodiversity, biosafety protocol, then you've got the climate ones, and then you've got some of the chemical wastes. Basel, Rotterdam, Stockholm, Minamata, Montreal, you know, you can go on. Um, but the, they're the probably the main trade relevant ones. So each one of them has uh, rules on reporting, non-compliance procedures, non-compliance measures, dispute resolution procedures. And within that, you've got things like third party verification and trigger, you know, it, it, it is uh, quite different according to the different, and there's different members of each of these uh, MEAs. So, but one of the things then is to create, you know, the knowledge on our partners and what they're doing in these different areas under these different MEAs and what does, you know, compliance mean. And, and an example from last week's communication on biodiversity was that there was, uh, the commission will create a new knowledge center for biodiversity. And uh, one of its duties would be to track and assess progress by the EU units, but also its partners in, in relation to implementation of biodiversity related international instruments. So it, 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 it's a matter of kind of uh, making sure that we have all the information to hand in this process. And that obviously that monitoring information would go into the implementation and enforcement work. Um, that's bilaterally. So I know I probably used up the best part of my 10 minutes. Um, multilaterally, just quickly to say, uh, you touched that on your, your report. Uh, in 2016, we pushed hard for an environmental goods agreement, yep. remain a staunch supporter of negotiations, uh, not just on tariffs, but also that it, it would be an ambitious forward looking, it would be a living agreement reacting to technology, et cetera, et cetera, commitments and services. Um, our line has been that negotiations should be take, taken forward again as soon as, you know, circumstances allow participants are ready for engaging but you know the, the situation is that sometimes uh, some of the partners are not ready to engage um that's obviously the, you know the, the still should progress and other res other initiatives like uh promoted i think last year by new zealand we're keeping a close eye on and looking at um you know, obviously we'd like to look at different options to, to re-engage on this link between trade and environment and multilateral trade uh, on for MC12, for the WTO MC12, whenever it happens, although I think it's next year. Uh, so, you know, you obviously we're, we're very supportive of these issues, but it is um, given, it would probably be discussed broadly over the next year. So there's not much I can say on that. I already mentioned the Energy Charter Treaty where within the TSD. So that's a kind of a plurilateral quasi in between. Um, so that's where it's at at the multilateral. Um, obviously we're, we're, we're a big supporter, but it depends on you know, the international uh, okay. climate. Happens, yeah. um, I, do, I don't want to take the steam out of the colleagues and I will stay quiet soon. Um, in terms of some of the unilateral kind of EU policy initiatives, which form the bulk of the Green Deal work, uh, the colleagues from Environment World Climate will go into detail, but there were some that are very di direct trade re relevance that I mentioned. Obviously, in the area of climate, there's the well-versed proposals on uh, CBAM, Carbon Border Adjustment Measure, which will have a very big, important uh, WTO component, but I don't think I need to say more about that uh, personally. In the area of deforestation, you mentioned um, the last week's biodiversity communications in 2021, there'll be a legislative proposal and other measures to avoid or minimize the placing of products associated with deforestation, deforest uh, degradation on the EU market, as well as to promote forest friendly imports and value chains. And this, and Javier will know more, it's uh, 
being supported by this that was published back in February, I think, impact uh, inception impact assessments for the fitness check of the timber regulation, but also for, for future rules for deforestation related commodities. So there's a lot of food for thought on our website. Um, also in the area of waste, which is not something I've followed uh, personally, there will be a review of EU rules on waste shipments. Um, and uh, last but not least, uh, last week's biodiversity communication also uh, signaled a new initiative on horizontal due diligence. Um, it's in the business section of that communication. So we put forward, it, it would be a new initiative in 2021 under the broad umbrella of sustainable corporate governance. Uh, it may take the form of a legislative proposal addressing not just environment, uh, but also human rights uh, and would treat different uh, enterprises in a proportionate way. So this is, uh, part of the work that has to be done over the next year, but it will be quite interesting work. And uh, I think there's, there's a lot of uh, maybe food for thought for, for the rest of today's session. So I'll, I'll, stay, I'll, I'll shut up now and let the other guys <laughs> talk. Thanks a lot, Neil. Uh, it's definitely good, you know, food for thoughts. You know, there's a lot of detail, which also makes me, you know, hopeful and, and convinced as well that, you know, that, you know, there are plans to take these promises from the Green Deal forward. And the steps are, you know, taken towards the direction and laid out as well towards that direction. Um, what I pick up particularly from what you said was, you know, in response to my, my, you know, question as to, you know, can we take sustainability um, provisions out of the box and, you know, mainstream or um, them further? You actually were saying that, you know, yes, you know, it's also been, you know, done and it can be done as well. Um, so that's that's one thing among the many things that that you you highlighted. Um, so thanks for that. I'm going to move on with the panel. Um, but before I do that, I'm going to throw in a few questions that we've gotten from the audience um, to the panelists to think and also others to think as well, you know, and pick up um, um, if, if relevant, particularly since there are a number of them are carbon related. Um, so, you know, might be there for a good segue towards, uh, towards uh, climate action and, uh, and Elena. But um, we've gotten a few questions um, linking to uh, trade and, um, and, you know, climate within that. So we have a question um, about the Paris Agreement. So um, asking basically, as the Paris Agreement's provisions are largely procedural, what does respecting it actually mean? Um, so respecting it in the context of uh, future trade agreements. Uh, would, e would the EU consider action in the case of not meeting uh, NDCs? So in nutshell, what's the, uh, what does it mean to be uh, respecting Paris Agreement uh, in more concrete terms? Um, and then there's also a question regarding the um, product standards um, to tackle carbon leakage. So has anyone or any work been done on the difficulty of measuring embodied carbon imported, imported products? So if anybody in the, in the audience or in the panel is aware of any such studies, you know, they can be also highlighted um, in, in the chat, for example, or, or somewhere else. So a few carbon related questions, um, not necessarily for Elena to immediately pick up, but you know, also for the rest of the panel to think about. But as with that segue, I'm going to move on to uh, our representative from the uh, DG Climate Action, Elena Bartram. She is the head of unit of international relations uh, and ready to tell us a little bit about, you know, what then our DG Climate Action's plan um, to implement trade-related, climate-related uh, uh, promises of the Green Deal uh, in the future. So uh, over to you, Elena. Thanks very much, Marianne, and both Marianne and Lisa, thanks for, for hosting this uh, session. I think it's very timely and pertinent. Um, and uh, of course, coming in the uh, wake of yesterday's adoption of the EU's own recovery plan, it's, it's also quite timely. Um, we were delighted to see um, the Green Deal and Digital confirmed as the central planks for, for deploying our recovery investments at the European level. And of course, that will then um, be propelled to, to the international discussions that we hope to be shaping in terms of the greenness of recovery. But let me start by maybe uh, picking up um, your, your question that came from the audience regarding the respecting of, of Paris Agreement um, and how do you define respecting Paris Agreement. You, you can of course look at it from a level of a um, the nation state or a party, as you would say in, in the agreement terms, 
And uh, in uh, the, the Paris Agreement, the, all parties have an obligation to, to have a nationally determined contribution at any given time. And uh, the consequent or the subsequent NDCs need to, uh, uh, you know, present progression over time. So this continuous uh, ambition increase is something that's enshrined in the Paris Agreement, as are the long-term objectives of um, uh, carbon neutrality. Uh, as soon as possible during the second half of the century, notably through balance between sources and sinks. So, so uh, you can look at it from a, a kind of uh, collective responsibility, which is for all parties, which is the spirit of Paris Agreement, uh, pursuing all the efforts for remaining, um, or, or commitment to remain within two degrees and pursuing efforts to remain within 1.5 degrees. So you can look at it from many different aspects, uh, but as in terms of compliance, um, as the Paris construct is a bottom-up based on national determination, that there are no sanctions. In fact, there are no sanctions uh, associated uh, in, in uh, terms of uh, any MEAs. It's more of a reputational uh, and, and you know, discretional uh, treatment change that then would apply in this context, but so we can we can you know you could write a thesis on this. So what I would suggest for my five minutes here uh, is that I, I take this a little bit to the more helicopter level, uh, looking at it first from uh, the point of view of what we have been doing traditionally before this current college. And then what the Green Deal uh, has meant for, for our trade and climate cooperation. And finally, to, to offer a few initial reflections about, okay, what's the post-COVID uh, recovery going to mean in, in this context? And if I start from kind of the traditional cooperation that we have had between DG Climate and DG uh, Trade, we have, of course, been from DG Climate participating in the negotiations, uh, bilateral negotiations on the uh, trade and sustainable development chapters. And as we uh, achieved the Paris Agreement, um, as that was ratified, it became a, a very uh, kind of concrete and tangible part of these trade negotiations. So there's mutual commitment to implementing Paris Agreement that's uh, very clearly written in all the uh, post-Paris Agreement FTAs. And even in the case of Canada, where the CETA agreement was agreed prior to Paris Agreement, we have added an addendum that stipulates this uh, mutual commitment to Paris implementation. In addition to this, of course, we have been pursuing uh, sustainable trade practices to trade-related assistance, which is something that um, has become increasingly pertinent, particularly in Africa. Uh, and, and the climate component, sustainability aspects are, are uh, mainstreamed in the trade-related assistance. And I think that's something that will be further pursued as, as we move on with the implementation of, um, uh, of uh, Green Deal. Uh, that the other side of our uh, kind of trade uh, shaping measures is, of course, the different regulations and standards that we have implemented in the EU that have really shaped, for instance, the automobile industry around the world. Our CO2 standards in cars, our you know, support to, to electromobility has, has significantly altered the way uh, investment in automobile sector is, is uh, decided upon, as the EU still represents a huge market for um, you know, exports uh, from uh, countries such as China, Korea, uh, and the US, and uh, by the virtue of having to, to revisit their production model, also these uh, good standards have been taken up uh, domestically. So I think there are many positive contributions that have been done. At the same time, I agree, TSD chapters, they're, they're not always the most lively ones. We have joint committees, we meet, we agree on high principles. And with the Green Deal, we have really wanted to, to look at the more operational aspects. And we have, for instance, in the context of CETA, been able to convene dedicated workshops between Canada and the EU to bring together stakeholders that are interested in accelerating low carbon transformation. And, and this has provided a powerful platform for sharing experiences, but also establishing networks between, um, between industry uh, 
Um, and I think this is something that we will want to examine further as, as the Green Deal uh, moves on. Um, so um, th that has all been kind of before, before um, the Green Deal even manifested itself. And in the context of Green Deal, of course, you already quoted uh, the relevant uh, references to, to trade as a measure. Um, the Green Deal also has the inclusion of the border measures. Uh, so in the absence of comparative uh, efforts or absence of climate ambition by our partners, the EU is ready to consider uh, carbon border measures uh, in order to ensure that carbon leakage doesn't happen from European industry and that we don't, um, you know, actually by introducing more stringent measures in, in the EU context that we don't, um, uh, you know, uh, see uh, leakage of our industries elsewhere, which would then in turn result in net um, increase in CO2 emissions. Um, this is, of course, something that we need to design with care. Uh, the technical and legal aspects of it have to be assessed. And, and I think at the current uh, planning, we have uh, the border measures proposal foreseen for, for uh, 2021 uh, summer or, or second half. What's key for us is that when we go out with something as uh, significant as a border measure, that it is, um, you know, bulletproof and, and that it stands to all legal uh, challenges because uh, we would not want to upset the already complicated trade conversations, which we will be seeing in the post-COVID um, world. Now, um, the, the uh, Green Deal also, of course, means that when we uh, you know, have increased our climate ambitions significantly, uh, and the climate neutrality efforts in, within EU will be accelerated. That's what, that will reshape the trade patterns and the trade balance. So there is expectations for us to become much less dependent on export imported um, fossil fuels, uh, as those will be substituted by more indigenous renewable energy sources, uh, which is uh, something that's often referred to as a strategic autonomy. So, so we'll become less dependent on imported fossil fuels from at times volatile uh, regions and, and uh, um, you know, the imports from rogue governments. We also expect that uh, as the low carbon industry really picks up uh, further in, in the EU, there will be more demand on the other hand, for, for um, raw materials required for, for low carbon technologies, such as raw railroads, um, different components of, of electric uh, vehicles and uh, the likes. So, so th there will be shifts uh, in, in demand um, of, of imports, but also in, in the way approach uh, our partnerships. Uh, what we want to ensure, of course, and this is something that the EU is a strong defender of, is, is a rules-based multilateral order, which allows fair access by all to those very precious railroads and, and the other raw materials required for, for um, increasing uh, the, the low carbon uh, investment. Now, um, maybe then going quickly to the COVID, post-COVID situation. Um, the recovery package that's been put forward by the Commission, and of course at this point it's only the Commission's uh, proposal, uh, sees the next generation uh, package of 750 billion, uh, out of which 500 billion would be uh, issued as grants and 250 would be in the form of loans. Um, in spending that the member states specific uh, or in dispersing the member states specific support, the EU will be looking at the national energy and climate plans, the, the integrated plans that are intended to stipulate how the member state will reach its 2030 target. And of course, the, the uh, recovery plan also confirms that we will be coming forward with our proposal to increase the 2030 target at EU level um, still during this year, uh, which will again uh, bring a new impetus for accelerating action. So while trade policies is not a policy driver for climate action, it's certainly a policy enabler. 
we will need this increased access to, to the materials and we will hopefully lessen our uh, dependency as we will need to rethink our supply chains. Um, you know, one of the things that the COVID crisis has exposed is, is our um, vulnerability to, as, as many of our own industries depend on components uh, that are produced elsewhere in the world and, and those supply chains have of course been disrupted. Circular economies is going to be a vital part of our efforts in this regard. Uh, at the moment some 12% of, of EU industrial uh, raw material or materials is recycled. Uh, we intend to increase that manifold and um, that too will lessen our dependency on um, exports uh, from uh, outside uh, countries and continents. So there's, there's a lot in place. Uh, on, on the final note, I'd like to say that as Green Deal stipulates, our first and foremost efforts will be placed on inducing ambition and action by our partners. Here, indeed, I think we have potential to look at the, the uh, FTA chapters beyond TSD, looking at you know, standards, regulations, public procurement rules, could we align our approaches in this respect? And um, we will be you know, hoping to enhance our regulatory cooperation in other areas um, as well, because this type of convergence is precisely what we would need in order to avoid ever having to take uh, the, the border measures in action. So um, I'll stop there and I look forward to the conversation. Thanks so much. Great. Thanks, Elena. Um, I think I'll, um, you know, of the rich sort of, you know, food for thought that you provided and also, you know, actions taking place and, you know, your plans and hopes and dreams for, for future. One thing I picked up was, you know, you're mentioning the uh, autom automobile sector and the regulation and basically what, you know, EU's elevation of standards in the EU already there did for elevation of standards also more broadly in the world. That's kind of a, you know, to highlight that as an example, it has been done before, or it hasn't happened before, so it can also happen in the future as well. So that, that's the kind of the way and the mechanism through which EU and EU trade uh, on different sectors can actually help also globally to, uh, to elevate the um, sustainability standards. Um, before I move on to, um, to Javier, um, so um, to DG Environment, um, I'm just gonna highlight that there are a number of questions popping up on Slido side, linking to reflecting basically Elena, what Elena has said and also what, uh, what Niall has said, particularly carbon related. So um, Lisa, can you just you know, put the Slido link again on the chat maybe, and then perhaps, you know, for example, while listening in Elena and also Neil can take a look at those questions as well and see you know, if there's um, uh, answers to them you know, towards the, the more discussion part a bit later as well. So uh, just saying that, you know, we are looking into those questions that the audience, been, audience has been sending and also trying to take them up and, you know, uh, draw attention uh, from our panelists to those as well. But now moving on to uh, Javier Arribas Quintana, who is a senior expert from DG Environment, uh, specifically focusing on environmental integration um, into trade policy. Um, so Javier, I think your colleagues have outlined, you know, a number of issues already, but I guess, you know, we'd love to perhaps hear from you then specifically maybe on the circular economy side, on the biodiversity side, so more really kind of these certain sectoral uh, policy dossiers and how they can be taken forward in trade. Um, so uh, over to you, um, some thoughts and reflections, please. Thank you, Marianne, uh, and good morning, everybody. And I hope every, uh, everybody's healthy and in good uh, form <laughs> this morning and you are somehow enjoying the spring weather wherever you are. We have a gorgeous weather here in Brussels. Uh, thank you the organizers uh, for this online event which is indeed uh, very timely and topical. Uh, trade and sustainability is uh, more than ever uh, an issue of uh, uh, fashion uh, and um, indeed uh, a number of uh, very interesting and important policy decisions and documents have been adopted in, in the very recent past. Uh, last week, uh, strategies that have been mentioned, uh, biodiversity, farm to fork, recently also in March, circular economy, and yesterday, more recently, the recovery plan by the Commission. So there are plenty of things to, uh, to think about it. 
and uh, the risk here is that we are a little bit um, out of date, not completely uh, uh, up to date. Um, I have the advantage of the of disadvantage of speaking third after my previous two colleagues. Uh, so th this in a way obliges me to focus on things uh, they have not mentioned, which is going to be difficult because they have they, they have mentioned, mentioned a lot. lot. Yeah. <laughs> um, I want to thank you also, Mariana, and, and I mean the, the, the authors of the uh, of the report and the presentation you made. You touch upon a number of recommendations, um, which actually um, they are very valid and very much welcome. Uh, and actually, we are already following some of them. Uh, I mean, you mentioned one that I, I particularly like, which is the unboxing TSD uh, from the TSD chapter in FTAs. I like that, uh, that, that expression and put it in, into a more horizontal uh, way all throughout the, the FTAs. And I think that's uh, an, a very good path to follow and we in the environment we are of the same of the same view that actually sustainability should be across the board uh, issue which should uh, feature uh, all through the the uh, FTAs. Uh, the questions you asked Mariana and, uh, and I suspect the questions that are coming in uh, through Slido are indeed very much uh, interrelated to what I'm going to say and what, with what has been said by my colleague Niall and, and Elena. Um, but um, uh, I don't want to overlap too much and I will try to um, address uh, basically um, two specific, uh, spe specific, specific aspect, um, aspects more in detail. Um, first, by way of framing, I want to say that uh, currently uh, both globalization uh, and international trade are concepts which are somehow in disrepute. Um, even though uh, it's true that most people uh, will recognize that their everyday life uh, would be extremely difficult without them. Uh, but what is um, out of question is that uh, for most people, um, uh, is I mean, I would say for everybody, it's clear. Uh, that if uh, we continue in business as usual mode, we will soon run out of planet. And the planet is limited, therefore uh, we have to do something. So the question is, what can we do about it? Uh, outer key is certainly an option, uh, but this will bring us to the night of times. So we better leave this option aside for the moment. Uh, perhaps more reasonable and certainly easier uh, to achieve. Um, to have a positive agenda for responsible and sustainable economic growth model, including trade, right? Uh, the thing is that we have all the policy elements at our disposal uh, to achieve that, uh, that goal. And actually the roadmap is very clear. We have it there, the agenda 2030, uh, and it's uh, 17, I believe, sustainable development goals uh, are showing the way to, to the entire world. So why don't we just do it, right? Uh, the post-COVID recovery crisis gives indeed an extra incentive to do that and uh, bring us a window of opportunity uh, with a build back uh, better perspective. Um, a kind of a second, a kind of a second chance, uh, perhaps the last one. So I think we better uh, take it this time. Um, as I said, many things have uh, already said by, said by my colleagues, so I will concentrate on, on two, uh, the Circular Economy Action Plan and the Biodiversity Strategy. Uh, on the Circular Economy, um, just framing the issue, the worldwide transformation to a circular economy, uh, basically entails moving from uh, linear, highly resource depleting uh, systems with uh, high emissions and a lot of waste generation and high impact on ecosystems and, and natural uh, capital, which is actually the model um, we are basically today, uh, towards something completely different, or if not completely, quite substantially different, uh, more circular, less uh, wasteful systems that use resources more efficiently and sustainably. 
uh, while at the same time providing work, work opportunities and um, a high quality of life. Uh, this is a key contribution to the 230 agenda uh, and indeed uh, the circular economy uh, and the underlying concept sustainable consumption and production um, uh, basically is at the origin of a number of SDGs. Um, um, reducing the, the consumption footprint and increasing the circular material use rate um, is, uh, as you know, a, a particular priority uh, for us, uh, which is also uh, uh, seen in the context of the European Green, uh, of the, uh, in the context of the European Green Deal. Um, um, also, it's an issue which relates to the strategic uh, uh, access uh, uh, to resources, which is a strategic, a strategic uh, security consideration for the EU. Natural resources and the PIN national economies provide crucial, uh, crucial raw materials for everyday life and are necessary to almost uh, every sector in the global economy. Um, and given the size of the demand, uh, raw materials, including uh, secondary, I mean, primary and raw materials uh, obtained by recycling, for instance, uh, will continue to play a major role in the global economy. So uh, this is something we cannot uh, ignore, um, uh, especially if we are to redesign a well-functioning economic slash uh, trade uh, system post-crisis. The problem is that the EU cannot deliver alone the ambition of the European Green Deal for a climate neutral, resource efficient and circular economy. Uh, the new circular economy action plan, which was adopted, as you know, um, in March, uh, the 10th of March, I believe, uh, made may clear that fact. Um, and therefore, the, the, the action plan makes a call uh, for the EU to continue uh, leading the way uh, to a circular economy at the global level and use its uh, influence um, and expertise and, and financial resources to implement uh, the 2030 Agenda. Um, they use green diplomacy efforts and its goal and its uh, global um, uh, soft power provide major prospects for promoting key circular economy policy, policies. Uh, and we are promoting that through various uh, number of methods and approaches uh, and tools starting by all the policy dialogues that we have, the trade relationship, the technical and financial assistance that we provide to, to countries. Uh, we try to align with the EU circular economy norms and standards, uh, product policy. We have discussions in the context of uh, global institutions, WTO, WTO, OECD, and the various subcommittee meetings that deal with these issues on, on trade and environment. I myself, I've been uh, recently attending some of them uh, in the for instance, Committee of Trade and Environment of the WTO. In November, there was a very rich discussion on, uh, on all these issues. Circular economy was at the core and issues related to plastics and things like that uh, came to the fore. And uh, there was a, a huge interest and a lot of, engage, uh, a lot of engagement by, uh, particip by participants. Uh, same in the OECD in February, a huge event also, uh, the Joint Working Party of uh, Trade and Environment organized a similar event. And again, uh, the reception and the uh, participation was uh, huge uh, and uh, a very interesting debate. So this proves actually that all these issues are, are in a way taking uh, um, ground uh, on the wider trade uh, and environment commun community and this is very good. I mean we started the battle a few years ago, we were basically alone, but now uh, I believe we are not anymore and this is, this is good news. Uh, I also myself participated at UNEA, the UN Environment Program in March 2019. Core business of that UNEA was sustainable consumption and production and there, same thing, big debate. Uh, uh, all the actors involved um, in, in increasingly uh, taking seriously these issues and uh, and, um, and circular economy being at the core of, of, all, of all these issues and uh, a number of resolutions were adopted in, yep. in that respect. Um, Javier, can I, Sustina, yeah. before, because you 
that's in the circular economy covered. So, um, and you said also, do you maybe you know would touch upon a little bit of deforestation and biodiversity? Uh, maybe next, yeah. moving on to next. I just, you know, I picked up a question uh, from the audience, which I thought, you know, I'll just, you know, feed in through here, um, which you might or might not be able to, you know, um, to, you know, to reflect or answer, but maybe, uh, um, maybe yes. So basically, there's a question whether the post-COVID environment in the post-COVID environment has the health been factored into the Green Deal. So the links between biodiversity loss and the zoonotic diseases and, you know, the leading of the pandemic. So that's kind of in a whole chain of thinking. Um, obviously links to the deforestation that's kind of you know where i'm going with this um so you know any any reflections on this regard you know how this has how this has been maybe you know picked up by dg environment uh biodiversity strategy perhaps as well and you know, has there any links been so far made with what's happening with the covid risk or the, 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 the way the way things played out towards you know the covid and the risk and you know bringing that also in the uh, trade scene so if there's anything you can you know, comment in that regard you know i thought i'm going to throw it in here before you're going to uh, reflect something on the biodiversity and deforestation as well you, you want me to answer that question already now or should i first mention the first the, the, the main yes, uh, action yeah. just you know, mention first the main action plan and then also you know think you know if there's something you can you can uh, you know link to link to this uh, yeah. link to this question no, I, well. I just wanted to to say um, uh, two words on on the main key actions of the circular economy uh, action plan which relates to uh, to trade and in, in particularly uh, uh, the efforts that we will lead uh, at international level to reach a global agreement on plastics as you know plastics has been a very topical issue and I mean it's a, a, an omnipresent and hugely traded uh, commodity um, and a number of initiatives have been uh, undertaken uh, but not in an holistic uh, way. Uh, there are UN efforts dealing with uh, marine litter uh, and microplastics, marine pollution. Uh, there have been a number of UNEA resolutions in that regard. The Basel Conven Convention, which uh, uh, was mentioned by Niall, um, uh, the WTO also initiatives, uh, uh, China was very keen to, to start something on, on plastics uh, uh, and still is, but there is no a holistic approach to that. And I think we, we in the Commission, in the environment, we certainly um, uh, will take, we'll continue um, taking the lead to, to, to mature the debate towards that um, uh, global agreement on plastics. Uh, and this is foreseen in the, in the action plan. Um, Global Circular Economy Alliance, this is something which is announced by the Action Plan. Again, the idea is basically uh, to, to identify knowledge and governance gaps. And we've been in talks already with UNEP to perhaps uh, uh, take the lead on, on the forming of that alliance. We will be very keen uh, to gather and to federate uh, uh, interest and, uh, and action around the, uh, around the world. Um, on, on this um, on this alliance. Um, in the same vein, uh, we are trying to explore the feasibility of uh, defining the what we call safe operating space. I mean, this is not a new concept. The IRP has been using this concept uh, uh, a lot in the in the past. And the idea here being uh, that um, we should set um, our planetary boundaries, uh, uh, the limits of, of uh, where we stand on, on the main. I mean, resources, water, soil, land, minerals, metal, biomass, and see what are the limits we should not uh, trespass in order to make sure that we don't, we don't put into question uh, our well-being and, and the well-being of future generations. Something, uh, this is something we will have to be working in, in, the, um, uh, in the future. And related to that, we are considering the possibility to an international agreement on the management of natural resources. Um, we are doing a number of other things, outreach, uh, also partnership, uh, partnership in, I mean, setting partnerships with, with key uh, um, countries and continents, uh, in particular Western Balkans and Africa too, uh, and we will continue to promote. Yeah. Alex, this is Berka Jami, Sorry. Um, on free trade agreements, I would not say much because this has been touched upon 
Uh, Niall, um, just to say that circular economy is part of those, and in particular in the last generation of, uh, of FTAs, uh, we are very keen in having more ambitious uh, circular economy language. And for instance, uh, with countries like New Zealand, we are going in basically in, in that direction. Um, I think on the, yeah. yeah. So I think you are you moving on to thinking of biodiversity and deforestation next? Yes, indeed. Yeah. Uh, I mean, biodiversity, um, you, you've seen the study which was adopted uh, um, a few days ago. Um, uh, we see the, bio the biodiversity as a central element of the EU recovery plan. Uh, also, it's crucial to preventing and building resilience to future outbreaks and providing immediate business and investment opportunities for restoring the EU economy, not only because of the huge cost which will run in the, and that we will run in the case of, uh, of inaction, which will be huge, but also because nature restoration actually provides immediate business and investment opportunities for restoring the EU economy, uh, in particular in a number of sectors, uh, just to mention construction, uh, agriculture, of course, uh, and, and and food and drink. Uh, uh, these sectors are highly dependent on nature and they generate huge amounts of, uh, of money. And uh, the benefits of biodiversity conversation for the economy are, are, are huge. That's uh, uh, no question about it. Um, um, Wonder how we uh, we either maybe lost Javier or is he's having a, having a thought? <laughs> no, I'm, I'm I'm trying to synthesize the uh, yeah. what are the key the key message here. Uh, but uh, I mean, since you mentioned deforestation, deforestation has been a uh, an issue that we've been thinking about for a long time, well before uh, the COVID crisis. We had a number of communications in the past, and the most recently in July, where we set up already. Um, um, the, the, the path of action uh, and um, uh, there we already announced uh, um, a number of, uh, of measures that we will, we will undertake, uh, not the least to mention the one that you have uh, mentioned and it, it was mentioned by Nile, which we, which we believe is, is key. Uh, we want to reduce the, the environment footprint of our, of our consumption uh, patterns um, in particular, when it comes to the impact that these consumption patterns uh, uh, have uh, has uh, uh, on 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 countries the um, exporting uh, forestry uh, goods, so we are currently carrying on an impact uh, an impact assessment in that regard, and we will come forward with a with a proposal. Uh, probably in the first quarter or second quarter of, uh, of next year. So this is uh, something which is uh, uh, an important an important element of, of the whole uh, forest deforestation uh, yeah, policy. Um, Great. Yeah. And Javier, I think I'm going to looking at thinking of the time as well. You know, if you don't mind, um, we can pause here and then maybe you know come back to the questions as well. You know, further reflections on that. Um, so making sure that you know we also have the uh, remaining panelists um, to be able to you know to uh, to reflect. If that's well okay by you. Um, that's good. So, uh, Super. Uh, and then again, you know, take a, do take a look at the questions that, you know, the panelists have been, have been already plenty of them coming in through, through Slido. Um, before I move on to, so next speaker on the panel, we're going to move from the Commission to the European Parliament and we should have Anna Cavaccini um, online, um, who is an MEP, Group of Greens, and most importantly for this particular uh, topic of the day, member of the Committee on International Trade. Um, so, uh, um, Anna, great to have you here. Um, loving to hear from the European Parliament perspective, hopes and wishes for you know, future EU uh, green green uh, trade deals. I know you're very active on this also on social media um, as well. So uh, thoughts on your side, um, over to you. Yeah, thank you, Marianne, and thanks, Lisa, for organizing this event and also for um, publishing this um, important study. Um, I really think um, this discussion on how to yeah, green the external dimension <laughs> 
of the EU um, economic policy and how to bring yeah, more sustainability in the trade policy is really, really crucial and important. And I have read all of your proposals with um, great interest and I think it's, it's good to discuss them today. I want to remind all of us why it's so important that we talk about um, trade policy and sustainability. Um, trade rules really, really shape our economy um, and they are hard to change. Like once they're there, they're really um, above <laughs> basically national legislation, national, national, national and European legislation to um, really yeah, implement the international trade rules. And if they're once there, it's, it's hard to change. So for the next decades, we often decide in those um, FTAs and international trade agreements um, how our international economy looks like. And this why um, um, this discussion is so important. Um, I uh, was supposed to talk about what the INTA, the Trade Committee, is discussing. And I can just um, tell you that the INTA is, as you can imagine, not um, united on the question. There is, of course, some people <laughs> saying that um, Trade is trade and sustainability doesn't really have to play a role in that or basically yeah, um, concentrating everything on the TST chapter saying yeah, we have the TST chapters. Um, it's basically enough um, because the Paris Agreement and human rights and social standards are already enshrined in our trade agreements and this is basically enough. Um, me and a lot of others say it's not enough and this is of course um, really part of the debate we're having basically every week in in the trade committee but i guess not only in the trade committee also in the council if you look at the um, non-paper that was um, published by the dutch and the french government who also tried to spur a debate in in the council so i guess it's good that in, in the parliament in the council and hopefully also in the commission um discussions are going on um I would say it is really important to look at the TSD chapters um, and you also um, made some suggestions in your study how to improve um, uh, the enforcement um, because we see that uh, the TSD chapter as they are designed at the moment really don't work so well. There's only one case at the moment where we kind of really look into some uh, yeah, <laughs> measures um, that is South Korea, but there have been a lot of trade agreements in place where there have been violations of the standards in the TST chapter when nothing has happened. For example, looking at um, the Peru Colombia trade agreement, but many, many others. So, one important thing is um, really um, increasing the enforceability of TST chapters, but this is clearly not the only thing because I think um, the structure of the trade agreement itself has to really um, change and has to be adapted to, to kind of change the sustainability um, standards. I think one very interesting example is indeed the mandate for the UK negotiations, because we see for the first time that um, the Paris Agreement is um, anchored as the, um, in an essential element, and that also some very concrete provisions on implementing the Paris Agreement are. Um, or like at least in the mandate, uh, proposed to be um, in the entire agreement, for example, um, joining the um, European emissions trading scheme or implementing a similar scheme. And this is also something that we Greens um, are proposing that only mentioning the Paris Agreement in the TSC chapter is not enough. We really need to have obligations in um, and also kind of a sanctions-based system that if a party is not um, um, reducing its CO2 emissions or is not really implementing a national policy framework that is correspondent with the Paris Agreement that there could also be a removal of some of the trade preferences. Um, then we also suggest um, differentiating a little bit more um, the products we are trading towards sustainability, for example, really trying to increase basically tariffs and make it a little bit more difficult to trade with goods that are very, very damaging for the climate. And on the other hand, of course, try to lift tariffs and obstacles much more in products which are um, sustainable, so differentiating a little bit um, what, what we are discussing. And thirdly, I think it is very important to also look at the rules that do harm or that prevent states from implementing climate policy, because some of the um, rules and trade um, really also hamper um, a very progressive national environment and climate policy. 
So I think it is also worth looking at what kind of rules we don't have to have in um, FTAs or where we need carve outs for um, creating more national like, policy space and implementing yeah, um, progressive climate policies. Um, uh, the men, yeah, deforestation was mentioned already. I mean, I'm working a lot on the Mercosur trade agreement. Um, we see that already in the past, the trade with soy really led to um, huge, huge, huge deforestation rates in the Amazon region. There's a lot of studies that show um, that trade um, really part that contributes to one, one sixth or more to deforestation in the world. Yeah, soy, um, palm oil, et cetera, et cetera. So I think it is really important to um, get rules in place that not only um, take care of yeah, illegal timber, illegal, illegal logging, this is important, but much more on the, on the land use change and um, integrate also this in, in trade agreements. Um, and in the case of yeah, Brazil, we have to be really, really reducing the, the soy imports from Brazil. Um, but of course, when you look at the macros work agreement, we see forecasts of um, yeah, increased agricultural exports from, from Brazil or from Argentina, um, beef, um, ethanol, uh, poultry, et cetera, et cetera, that will increase definitely the pressure on the Amazon region um, without, on the other hand, having a really yeah, binding, enforceable mechanism of, of how to deal with breaches of yeah, <laughs> environmental policy in Brazil, for example. So um, we say, when you look at these very specific trade agreements at the moment being negotiated, um, this would be exactly the wrong, wrong, wrong uh, direction to take. Um, because we talked a lot about the theory today and general policy proposals, but I also really wanted to point to the fact that there are a lot of agreements being negotiated at the moment that don't adhere to, to Green Deal standards in my mind and to climate standards, and we have to see what, what happens um, to them. Um, one other um, aspect was mentioned already, what is very important, and um, we as Greens are fighting for that for a long time together with other groups, is of course um, mandatory due diligence. I mean, this has nothing directly to do with bilateral free trade agreements. Um, it will be um, a Euro European legislative initiative to reform corporate law. Um, and we are very happy that the Commission or Commissioner Reinders um, already like three weeks ago in our event in our, um, organized by some parliamentarians um, proposed a legislative initiative for, for next year. This is a very big step forward to my mind, trying to ensure that human rights and environmental standards are um, yeah, um, kept throughout the entire supply chain. Um, so this is a very important step forward, but I think in the other areas that I mentioned, um, for me, the policy at the moment is far too much business as usual. And I think it is too late if we only start reforming the future trade agreements, because we are already negotiating with the entire world right now. Um, I mentioned Mercosur, Mexico, um, Indonesia, Australia, New Zealand, so many trade agreements, and if we don't um, start changing already now our policy, I mentioned at the beginning how much they shape our economy. It will be too late in, in my mind. Probably the last two ideas before I stop. I think it would be also in general important to measure the impact of CO2 on CO2 emissions by trade liberalization. Um, I mean, the commission does already this yearly, I think it's a yearly um, report on yeah, the state of the of, of trade and of the trade agreements. And I think it would be really important to um, incorporate also a section on really measuring the impact of, of new FTAs on CO2 emissions, because I think we don't have so much data on that. And lastly, um, of course, I would um, find it very, very important to, um, <laughs> this is not surprising, give the European Parliament a bigger say in the shaping of um, FTAs, because at the moment um, we can only say yes or no at the end. And um, I think it would be really, really important that um, the European Parliament also has a say on the mandate, because then we can really from the beginning say um, and discuss what we want to have 
in an FTA that is then being negotiated for several years. And then at the end, it's really too late to change something, or this is often the argument. So I think it would, import, would be important to, to really have um, yeah, a more democratic step forward in trade policy as well and giving the parliament um, the power of co-deciding on the mandate together with the council. Um, yeah, I'll stop here, but I'm happy to also take um, questions and debate with you. Thank you. Super. Thanks, Anna. Um, thanks a lot for that. Uh, before we move on to our last panelist, I'm going to bring a few questions um, linking to what you said, Anna, from, from the audience. Um, so I think they're quite, quite well um, aligned, you know, what you've been saying. So there's a kind of comment or question to the audience. Um, again, we talk quite a lot about Paris Agreement and, you know, the climate related provisions. Um, so about the making the Paris Agreement an essential element of the EU FTAs, um, what would that mean for the enforcement? Would an additional enforcement mechanism be created? Um, is a question. I think it kind of get from from what you said, Anna. That you know, from your perspective, you know, you were kind of alluding to that. You know, there we will need more enforcement um, to be able to work better with what we have, not only you know looking into the future agreements where we will be uh, will be doing this. Um, another comment, a question as well, um, is about the um, feasibility of the French and the Dutch proposal that came out a um, week or so ago on trade and climate, uh, and the idea of conditioning the tariff liberalization on trade uh, on attainment of climate objectives by partners. So, you know, any thoughts or comments on that? But again, we are really in the space of um, how can we, how can we uh, regulate as an EU better, make sure that we will be enforcing the Paris Agreement um, provisions uh, and the climate related provisions, uh, working with what we have at the moment and perhaps also you know, under the carbon border uh, adjustment mechanism. So those questions, we'll see if we will be having the time to actually uh, to address them, but at least you know, they have been now you know, uh, put forward by the audience to the thinking hats um, of our panelists as well. But with that, um, final panelist, last but certainly not least, um, Emmanuel Guerin, who is the executive director for International Group of the European Climate Foundation. Um, and the reason why we invite Emmanuel to be part of the panel as well is to reflect at large, you know, working together with the civil society, uh, also providing support to civil society to work on these topics, um, collecting some th uh, thoughts in terms of, you know, the um, possibilities, uh, opportunities and threats as well in terms of uh, concerns um, and wishes um, where the trade, EU trade should go next in terms of sustainability. So, um, Emmanuel, some thoughts from your side as a, as a final panel, panel member. Thank you very much, uh, Marianne and Thank you very much uh, for the invitation to join this um, very interesting panel. Um, I must say, and congratulations to you and other colleagues and partners um, on this project, um, trade and the environment, trade and climate more specifically. Um, it's, um, it's a very difficult topic, uh, but you're, you're doing it uh, very well. Uh, I'll, I'll be very brief uh, because I'd like to um, concentrate um, on what I consider to be a truly essential um, in this debate um, as opposed to the many uh, details uh, that also need to be addressed. Um, and I'll first um, concentrate on your Marianne um, and then uh, react um, and debate uh, with uh, the previous panelists um, in the hope um, as well that we can, uh, we can discuss with uh, the other uh, participants. To your first question about um, civil society, and I'll, I'll certainly not uh, claim that we represent civil society at large, um, even less uh, that we uh, support all of um, civil society. Um, uh, what we're seeing um, in supporting uh, many different partners um, in Europe on the trade and the environment, uh, think tanks like you, um, NGOs, um, activists, uh, lawyers, um, many of them um, use different than tactic, um, is I think that um, even, even if you rightly said at the beginning, and that's very much you. Oh, 
it said that I was muted by the host. Can you still? That was no, no. I was, I was, I was trying to mute myself, uh, and I accidentally muted you. So you know, please don't take it personally. It was you know my lapse. <laughs> no worries. No worries. If trade and trade agreements, in particular, uh, can be um, a tool uh, for greening the economy, achieving sustainable development, and that's very much a view we have at the European Climate Foundation, partners uh, we support. Um, I think civil society organizations often have. Um, and rightly so, um, I would say, um, a worry uh, that trade agreements um, are in practice. Um, whether it is intentional um, or not, that's not uh, really the clear. Uh, the effect of weakening uh, the environmental regulations in Europe, um, as opposed uh, to being conceived um, as a tool for a race to the top. Um, and unfortunately, we've got um, many examples of that. Um, I think this is a trend that is amplified uh, by what um, Anna said, which is the way in which uh, these uh, agreements are um, negotiated, uh, unlike until agreements, and in fact, unlike many other international agreements, which certainly doesn't help uh, a constructive role, uh, let me put it like this, uh, because when you're presented with a binary option of saying yes or no at the end of a process, you are by definition uh, putting uh, people um, into uh, a bit of a radical position. Uh, so I, uh, we would see a much more honest and uh, constructive debate with uh, civil society, the rules um, of discussing and negotiating these uh, agreements um, was implemented. Uh, second, I think this is that worries amplified by the fact that um, uh, the lion's share um, of the new trade agreements are bilateral and regional um, and not multilateral. Um, and this is a very difficult challenge for uh, civil society means uh, that um, as opposed to being um, a centralized uh, battlefield in Geneva around the WTO, uh, this is a very, very decentralized uh, one and you need to watch um, all the uh, bilateral and regional uh, agreements. Uh, that are being negotiated without necessarily capacity uh, to do this. Uh, so that's that's the two things I um, wanted to say um, in response to your question on civil society. Then the main point um, I'd like to make um, in this debate, um, have heard uh, the previous participants um, and also very much taking in um, the uh, current context um, of the COVID crisis, the recovery from it, um, and uh, the, I thought, um, very bold and very welcome announcement that made by the President of the Commission um, yesterday. Uh, it's a point um, that will not surprise you uh, around the border tax um, adjustment. Not necessarily because I think this is the most important um, tool uh, in the books uh, that we have, uh, but this is certainly the most sensitive, um, as pointed out by previous speakers, um, and there is also potentially a lot of misunderstandings um, around that lead to counterproductive um, outcomes from an economic, environmental, and uh, social uh, perspective. And the point I'll like to make, um, I, I very much agree, uh, by the way, with um, um, Evelina that um, it, it, it's very important um, uh, to have the policy design of the instrument right, uh, because you need to make sure uh, that it stands the test of all um, and um, a likely um, attack uh, by those uh, who will have uh, to play by the rules um, of that instrument um, if it was to be implemented. 
but even more um, important uh, than the policy design in my view um, is politics and the geopolitics um, and how it is uh, played by the uh, European Union. Um, and to be clear, um, I am, I am um, a supporter um, of the concept uh, of a border tax adjustment uh, because I think this is one tools uh, Europe has within its toolbox to achieve what is its top political priority and rightly so, and that's the Green Deal. But it's important, uh, it's important to put the, uh, the priority first achievement of the green, in particular, zero greenhouse gases emissions by 2050. And then to think about how to align policy instruments with the political priority. And I think if you do it like that, you realize that it's, it's impossible for the EU to put it in place unilaterally. Um, and I think, I think the EU should very much learn from its mistakes, um, and in particular, the attempt at including international um, aviation within the emission trading scheme. Uh, we know what happened um, after that. And the outcome was not um, highly bad, by the way, because it led uh, to a breaking of the deadlock uh, within uh, the ICAO. Uh, the discussions have been much more positive since then. But I don't think uh, we really have um, that um, as a possibility in front of us. And I think we can achieve much better. Um, and at the risk of being a bit provocative, I would argue that Europe needs to discuss um, the implementation of a border tax adjustment with China first. Uh, and there is a very good political um, opportunity for doing it, which is the uh, Leipzig EU-China um, summit. Um, and I think, I mean, the threat of the border tax adjustment um, is definitely um, a trigger for climate action in China, but I would go one step further um, and I would put it in the context of a deal, of a bargain uh, in between Europe and China first before building a larger coalition of countries uh, saying, well, if the EU and China increase their nationally determined contributions to 20 in the context of the moment, then there is no reason why the uh, European border adjustment uh, should penalize uh, China and other uh, countries that follow uh, the speed well as the letter um, of the Paris Agreement and in line with objective and time frame. Uh, revise um, by the time of COP26 their nationally determined contribution. So um, that's that's the proposal that I've on the table, um, and uh, I'll, I'll I'll just summarize by saying, uh, for me, um, even more important again than the policy design of the border tax adjustment. Um, is the politics, the geopolitics. Um, if we don't want it to uh, trigger a trade war, uh, which would not only be um, negative from an economic point of view, but also from an environment point of view, um, um, we need to conceive this very important move and tool in support of the European Green Deal uh, cooperatively um, and not as a unilateral measure that otherwise would definition and rightly so uh, be interpreted as a protectionist uh, measure. Thank you. Thanks Emmanuel. Um, also you know for some you know uh, mildly provocative thoughts you know I think you know we do need to you know put these out there in the open and then just you know see uh, see you know what the uh, what the response is and you know what what others think as well. Um, Looking at the time, um, first of all, you know, thanking all our panelists for you know very rich interventions. Uh, there certainly has been uh, plenty of food for thought, and also you know really concrete actions and thoughts. You know what to do next from the Commission, the European Parliament, but also you know from uh, now from Emmanuel. Um, what I'm thinking to do is you know plucking up you know for Emmanuel you know highlighted the importance of multilateralism. I think that was one of the things that you know he was really 
came came across from what you said. Um, so there are questions linking to that um, from uh, from Carolyn, um, from our colleague Karen from from uh, from Geneva, and she's asking, you know, could we hear more about EU's multilateral trade vision strategy for advancing environmental sustainability and concrete action on climate SDGs at the WTO? That might be, you know, a question towards you know Neil to your camp. Um, so if you if you're still there, I hope you're still there. You know, maybe maybe you can reflect that a little bit, and I'll give you some time to reflect, um, picking up a few questions. From the from the audience, which I don't think we have perhaps time to go into anymore, but you know I think there kind of are there's some questions which are kind of in a similar vein. So just putting it out there for future discussions that we hopefully will be having as a community or you know bilaterally. But um, one question is about um, the role that consuming less in the first place uh, should play in the trade debates and policies in the future. So the whole idea of you know really looking at also our consumption patterns. Um, how should that be played into in the trade debates? And uh, is the current crisis an opportunity in this regard? So that's you know, a good, bigger horizontal question in, in, in this space. Um, and also um, a reflection and question from the audience saying that you know, the proposals by the commission seem about more adding sustainability to deals in the future, but not to remove provisions in deals that have negative impact in the first place. So, you know, how to change that? So we have things in place which are, you know, are having negative impacts. You know, can we also you know, do some removal in addition to while doing some adding up? So that's also one more broader question that we have. But um, with those thoughts, you know, from, um, from, kind of from, from Carolyn, from, uh, from the multilateral side, you know, towards Neil, you maybe reflect, you know, so EU's plans, WTO, um, multilateralism, uh, where could we go, go from there? Um, Marianne, you want to make, yeah, you, sorry, yeah. The questions. Uh, are they yeah, the questions about, you know, EU's plans in WTO and, and, you know, basically supporting, taking WTO, taking these issues forward in the WTO context, sustainability and environment um, more broadly, so specifically that. Okay, so there, there, there's not much I can say here, um, unfortunately, um, there was the MC12 that was planned for this summer and then that was postponed till next year. We do have a trade strategy that was, um, it, it's been in the making, but it's, it's been uh, sh indicated yesterday that it would be the end of the year and then there would be, part of that would be a discussion on WTO reform. And I would imagine um, that a part of that would relate to sustainability. Um, now, there are, you know, various groups within the WTO called, you know, Friends of Sustainable Trade Fast or, you know, and it's a matter of discussing, but it's um, definitely the postponement of the MC12 has definitely taken the edge off some of that discussion. And it, it, it's really about the, the next few months in terms of this uh, trade strategy, but I am not in my current position actively involved in that that is a broader discussion um so there's, there's, there's not much i can say but just to, to to read the documents that came out as part of the response to the crisis yesterday and for you know stakeholders to actually come forward with ideas over the next few months but just to reiterate what i said you know our, our position with regards to these sort of uh, discussions like EGA, we remain very much a staunch yeah. supporter of these issues. So uh, our position has not changed. Um, so it, 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 it's very much uh, as was. Yeah. Uh, it's, so it's, it, it, it's very much more to do with, uh, you know, other dynamics. I, I, I'm afraid, I'm sorry, I can't give you a more no, no, that's that's already good, and I think you know that's a you know, good reflection. And what I'd like to do next is actually to give the floor for a brief moment to to Carolyn, uh, so colleague Carolyn Deer Birkbeck, who um, is a senior researcher from the Graduate Institute of Geneva, uh, and knows quite well, you know, what's going on in Geneva and WTO. Um, so, Carolyn, I've asked you to you know have, listen carefully and also perhaps you know reflect a little bit what you hear from the EU side and say you know, how that links with what you've also now currently hearing and, and being part of discussions in the Geneva side as well, in the hub of the multilateralism uh, WTO discussions. So uh, some you know, quick reflections from your side, um, you know, how does what we are saying here more in the EU context also map against you know, what the discussions are in Geneva? Great. Thank you very much, Marianne, for the opportunity and a really great discussion. Um, I think just as there's only a very few minutes, I'd like to pick up on um, 
one of the points that Emmanuel made is that um, we need to think about the geopolitics or the broader context in which we're trying to advance the EU's trade policy agenda on the Green New Deal, because ultimately, you know, the EU will need to bring other countries in the world on board. Um, and the question is how best to do that. Um, and I appreciate, you know, that we need to start, you know, um, domestically or regionally with that. But I think it's really critical to think how they can move forward in the multilateral in arena in a way that builds understanding and shared action on these issues. So one of the issues um, that's underway in Geneva is this push for a ministerial statement on environmental sustainability and trade, um, which many countries still um, uh, are interested in advancing. And I think that that will still be a deliverable, there's still an intention that that will be in the deliverable for MC12 and the EU is part of the FAST group. But um, we would need them to be actively engaged to bring developing countries on board. And so part of that is thinking about how the EU presents its work on climate and the Green New Deal to other member states at the WTO and build bridges or ways of building understanding um, in that context, because there is a lot of apprehension um, about the EU's agenda in that respect. But I also think when this is really critical that there are a lot of potential allies um, the scene has changed from the old sort of north-south one. There are many developing countries that consider themselves allies of a sustainability agenda. I think specifically on climate action, um, especially LDCs and SIDS who are those in the front line of climate impacts, that they get trade shocks related to those. Um, there's a huge issue, economic issue for them on that front. So, so they're willing to be part of a discussion. And I think part of it is for the EU to come to Geneva willing to talk about the climate issues that matter to other countries as well like around labeling, around fossil fuel subsidies, around greening aid for trade to support climate resilience. Um, there's a set of other issues around circular economy and low carbon issues. And if, if they can be seen to be part of the dialogue around climate at the WTO, we may have more prospects for advancing or building support for their approach on, um, on border measures. Um, I'm just gonna quickly, uh, so uh, yeah, I guess the key thing is for the EU and we, it would be great if EU civil society and think tanks and others also thought, um, and national governments also thought about how better the EU can use and engage in the multilateral process as a way of building a broader consensus on um, sustainability and trade. I think we would really count um, on the EU being an active um, player in that respect. I think that's probably all of my three minutes. Super. Thanks, Carolyn. Um, it's, uh, the thought here was, you know, it's the better we can also make links between Brussels and Geneva, um, you know, the more we will be able to make uh, as a community together. So that's also, you know, why we you know, want to also bring Carolyn in and, you know, have him have her listen and also, you know, do um, give a piece of you know, um, uh, reflection from that side. Because also there are, you know, similar webinars have been happening, you know, um, already in the past, but also in the future in Geneva with Geneva community. So we're trying to you know, be, uh, do our best to cross fertilize, fertilize basically, uh, as well. Um, but we are down to our last minutes and, and it has been really great to hear all these rich comments from the panel and, and you know, really concrete thoughts as to what to do next. Uh, I think that's, that's been the, uh, really the, um, the key value of this morning. Obviously, that also has meant that, you know, we've been kind of trying to rush behind a little bit with the questions from the audience, you know, which we apologise, you know, obviously it'd be much more easier had we had a full half a day somewhere, you know, together in, in Brussels. Um, but that having that been the case, um, you know, we do what we can. But before we close, I would however like to, you know, to feel like um, it would be a polite thing to do, you know, hand it over to the panellists very quickly to say, you know, does anybody from the panel have anything that they want to still comment, reflect on, you know, what has been said or suggested as to the question. So, uh, Neil, um, Elena, um, Javier, um, uh, Anna, and also, you know, Emmanuel, if there's something else you'd, you know, very quickly would like to, you know, conclude or say, you know, please, uh, please raise your hands or, you know, unmute your mics, uh, now would be the moment. I see Alina at least unmuting her mic, so I think yeah, you might want to say maybe something. just very quickly. I'd like to thank you for for setting up the panel, and uh, I think some of the points about multilateralism and working with the partners in WTO were very pertinent. And of course, we will be looking to when the uh, MC12 does take place, we'll be looking to have some kind of forward-leaning uh, green recovery consistent action incorporated in 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 uh, any possible communications. That's that's clear. And should there be scope for, for revitalizing the environmental goods agreement discussions, then, then we will be the first ones to, to support that action. That was a clear disappointment for us. Multilateralism is the central plank 
of all EU action and you can count on us to, to continue to defend mechanisms and agreements that uh, are in the heart of it. I'll, I'll stop there. Thanks. Thanks, Elena. Um, Anna, you are you know, unmuted, so I think you, know, you also want to say a few words. Yeah, I just want to say some final remarks. Um, what I really liked about this discussion today is that you brought together also people who don't only work on trade, uh, but also from environment and climate, because I think what is often lacking, I see it also in the NGO scene, but in, in, in science and so on and so on, that there is this trade community and there's really like, it's very special education, it's a very special mindset. And I think we have to really broaden up um, this community and include um, the climate uh, people, the environment people in, in that discussion because it's a lot about um, policy coherence in, in, in this uh, field. Um, I, my really final, final remark is to remind us all that um, our internal market and also our trade policy, our economic strength is really one of the big strong tools we have <laughs> at hand in the EU and we should really make use of that tool in pushing our environmental and climate goals as well and it has to go um, hand in hand together because otherwise uh, we will never reach the yeah climate goals that were set in the Paris Agreement. Um, thanks so much for the discussion. I also have to run off now to the next uh, panel but thank you so much. <laughs> Super, thanks Anna and good luck with the next panel. Uh, thanks for joining us today this morning. Um, so uh, Javier, Emmanuel, uh, Neil, any, anything further you know uh, from your side um, for these last, last minutes? Um. Yeah. Javier, do you want to go first? Uh, uh, as always. Go ahead. Okay, thank you. Um, now, just basically to, to thank you, Marianne, and thanks to the organizers of this uh, uh, event, which uh, was very useful for all of us. Uh, there are plenty of things that we could have uh, uh, touch upon, but we leave something for, for, for the future. We are in touch with Mariana and uh, and the Institute, because we are, as Niall said, we are currently undergoing a, a study on, on the possible impact of liberalization and trade on biodiversity loss. So we'll, be, we'll continue to be in, in touch uh, on these issues. Um, I realized that I didn't address the issue of zoonotic origin of the COVID. Uh, this is a question which is uh, out there. Uh, there has been huge uh, amounts of amounts of ink which has been spent on on all this uh, uh, lately. But I think what is important here is uh, not to run or not to rush into emotional type of uh, uh, discussions and have a science-based uh, approach to all the the things which are happening, the origin of the disease, what can be done, what cannot be done, and and have a, a well-informed debate. We have a number of tools in the European Union uh, to deal with a number of issues, not the least our cooperation uh, uh, and green diplomacy uh, efforts, uh, um, but uh, definitely we should not uh, rush into quick conclusions into, uh, on this particular question. Otherwise, uh, yes, plenty of things to do. A question of resources definitely for everybody, for us too. Uh, um, luckily, yesterday we saw uh, important numbers on the recovery plan uh, announced by the President of the Commission. We'll see how all this uh, plays out in, in the favor of uh, putting in place uh, um, the European Green Deal uh, priorities. Thank you very much. Thank you, Javier. Indeed, you know, fingers crossed for, you know, uh, getting the resources right to the right places. Uh, Neil, a final word is yours because Emmanuel is saying, you know, he needs to rush off as well. So, you know, he's saying thank you to everybody and uh, um, and uh, following up, you know, it's about Sam. Neil, okay. final word, DG Trade. No, I would just uh, remind just uh, for people to, because the, 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 a lot of the discussion was how do we streamline um, and, you know, discussion about TSD and, and that the, there are very useful provisions in other chapters, like in the energy raw materials chapter on promoting renewable energy and environmental impact system. So I would, uh, you know, suggest having a look and, and you know, seeing how they feed into the whole discussion. Excellent. Yeah, good point. Thank you for that. Um, so I'll say thank yous from the, you know, the co-pilot side first, and then I'll hand over to Lisa for the final, final thank yous. Um, um, so great thank you to the panelists. Great thank you for all who you send in questions uh, or you know, will line up for questions. And you know, also big apology for all whose questions we weren't able to, you know, to bring in to the discussion. Uh, we'll learn from that. And hopefully you know, when we will have our next webinar on the topic, you know, we'll 
see how we can even better organize so we'll have you know questions and more discussion so we're still learning how to how to use this space for particularly interactive discussions even better but i hope you've all learned as much as i've learned today you know in terms of more concretely what it means to take this agenda now forward on different fronts um word climate word you know in the trade um trade department or words at the european parliament or word dg environment um or indeed in geneva so uh, with big thank yous, um, please let's stay in touch. Let's keep on dialoguing, you know, through different ways and means, and also, you know, circulating information on different uh, webinars that might be taking place on this topic. Um, that will be great. Um, so, thank you, everybody, uh, from my side. Over to you, to Lisa, for the very last thank you. I think. Yeah, thank you so much, everyone, for joining in, for being panel members, for our wonderful moderator and lead author of the study, Marianne. Um, I think, yeah, the existence evidence uh, does indeed demonstrate that um, much remains to be done when it comes to uh, integrating social and environmental aspects to trade. Um, and improvements are super important because the EU is the world's great, greatest um, trading bloc and has therefore a considerable impact that we should not um, underestimate. Um, and now in the EU, the, the European Green Deal is at the heart of the recovery from the crisis and trade should definitely not be an exception and it should also hold up to the expectations of all the objectives laid out in the, in the European Green Deal. Um, so uh, thank you for, for this discussion and I'm looking forward to, yeah, continue debating and working for a better trade regime. <laughs>